Introducing the new high-performance shaving system from Kronar Industrial Smoothing. Our triple-headed nano-belt sander rotates at over 3,000 times per second, which means by the time the pain reaches your neural pathways, 37.6 of the hottest women in your postal district will be rubbing their eager cheeks over your freshly shaven chin. Midwest Housewives will offer you unchaperoned access to their daughters. By the time you leave the skin graft clinic, teenage suicide rates will have tripled, the hymen of 600 spinsters will have spontaneously combusted, and every man you shake hands with will start to have serious misgivings about his wife. The manufacturer can only guarantee searing pain and a creeping sense of inadequacy. But you have to admit all that other stuff sounds too damn sexy not to cough up £39.99 for just in case. Krona, just in case sexy women want to have sex on your face. Sex. The life and times of Osset Flushdyke. It's a bit like Jeeves and Worcester, but with a lot more jokes about todgers in it. Episode 1 is sponsored by Kronar Industrial Smoothing. Baltic Flush Dyke, beat it rapidly. No, no, allow me to clarify. Baltic Flush Dyke, beat it rapidly. But the chap he'd been fighting gave chase. For it was true to say that a rowdy element had come on the tennis club's annual African safari. It was summer 1922, and Lionel Brideshead, the men's singles champion, had made a point of calling Osset a jug-eared tosser over supper, forcing my master to rampantly stretch his nipples. Oh, come on! Nipples is a perfectly respectable word. It's not as though I said flange. That's a perfectly horrid word when you're not talking about plumbing. You cut those bits out, yes? <clears throat> And all this was over a girl. For Brideshead and Osset both wanted to make a play for Jemima Pendleton, a sweet young ingenue on their return to minor swelling. But Osset's confidence was shattered. He was gloomy and prone to periods of introspection, which made him like an old sheep, difficult to fully penetrate. Oh, what? I mean after you've cooked it because the mutton's tough and you can't get your knife in. You utter tit. Which button is it? Oh, yes. And so it was that I, Albert Jenkins, as its loyal manservant, came to assist my master once more in the ways of love. June 10th, 1922, and once more in Africa. By day, Jenkins and I shoot things. By night, I become somber and yearn for true love. Dinner is served, sir. I've lost my appetite, Jenkins. I'm hopelessly lovesick. Are you, sir? Yes. I'd always thought that by now I'd have been struck by Cupid's marrow. That's Cupid's arrow, sir. Is it? <laughs> Maybe that's where I'm going wrong. But love may strike at any moment. Believe me, I know. Do you share, Jenkins? Yes, sir. There comes a time in every man's life when he can no longer ignore what's happening to him here inside his chest. That sense of unbearable longing. No, sir. Man breasts. What? They just creep up on you. One day, flat as a pancake. Next day, small, pointy heat eats. I see. But a man must make a choice, sir. Become bitter and despondent, or face the world head on and say, Here I am, Cupid. Come and get me, big boy. And the man breasts? Looking pretty perky, sir. Oh, bugger. But never give up. As my father once said, Albert, a man may go his whole life and not know the love of a good woman. In my case, because he prefers the love of a good man. Oh, my goodness. But a man that believes in love, sir, a man who can lay down his life for love, a man who would sacrifice all he has for love, may get there quicker if he just loses the man tits. That's all I'm saying. Sod off, Jenkins. Sodding off now, sir. June 11th, 1922. Brideshead and the others leave for home today. I have given up on Jemima Pendleton and must resort once more to casual liaisons with African tribeswomen. Jenkins? Sir? Sort me out for a new bar or two, would you? Yes, sir. Not asking for much a good old-fashioned seeing to. Nothing pervy. I don't want to sit on anything. I get you, sir. You want me to be your... Go-between matchmaker. Pimp, sir. Pimp, fine. Absolutely. We're all grown-ups here. Damn it, Jenkins, I want to find love, I do, but not, frankly, before I've sown some wild goats. Wild oats, sir. Really? But I brought some with me. I'm sorry, sir. Look, it's not that I've given up on love, Jenkins. Ah, you should never do that, sir. As my father once said to me... Oh, no. Never give up on love, Albert. Particularly love for your fellow man. Your father loved his fellow men. Usually when mother was at work. I see. But he always knew that love could achieve the impossible, sir. 
He met this crippled beggar once. Oh, how awful. Knelt down, took him gently by the hand and said, Jesus loves you, my child, and I'd like to knead your buttocks. And I'm not a religious man, sir, and I don't believe in miracles, but that beggar, he got up. And he ran. Yes, thanks for that, Jenkins. Love can build a bridge, sir. Shut up. Love can build a Just bridge. shut up, will you? Yes, sir. I'd still like some rumpo, though. Step into my canoe, sir. September 10th, 1922, and back home after many splendid orgies. Clueless as to why the first speaking engagement at the Rotary Club went down so badly, until Jenkins pointed out I'd misread the part about liking nothing better than waking up in the morning and going for a vigorous walk. That was rather unfortunate, sir. And if I may be so bold, you do need to notice the full stops. Do I? Yes, sir. In the part of the speech where you recounted our trip to Siam... Oh, that was fun, that trip. Yes, sir. But what you should have said was, one night in Bangkok, Jenkins met this simply beautiful lady. Boy, she was gorgeous. What did I say, then? It doesn't matter, sir. It was only a small cock-up, wasn't it? That's what people kept asking. Newspaper? Yes, sir. Goodness, my butler slept with transsexuals, says local man. Well, we're not inviting them to any parties. Yes, sir. The manservant denies it, apparently. You've ruined my life, sir. Don't know what the world's coming to. Jenkins, it's time I gave you a pay rise. Really, sir? No, no, that wasn't it. Do you know, I have one of the most unreliable memories. Unreliable memories, sir? Yes, of course. I remember Uncle Bruno's coming to visit. Is he, sir? Yes, he'll be here this afternoon. And you're sure that's a good idea, sir? How do you mean? Well, sir... It's just that I always understood Uncle Bruno to be one of, um, those uncles, sir. Oh, goodness me, no, Jenkins. It's always been totally harmless between us. I mean, it's not as if we've never got up to stuff that might be seen as dubious. I see, sir. Like, when we went swimming, we'd come out of the water all shivery with our bits shriveled up and scamp around the changing rooms naked, whacking each other's buttocks with our soaking wet trunks. Great days. <laughs> that wasn't me, sir. No, that was Uncle Bruno. But the point is, Jenkins, he's never behaved inappropriately with me, so I'm not going to beat myself off about it. Beat yourself up about it, sir. Not beat yourself... Oh, thank heavens for that. I'm just saying you have my Uncle Bruno all wrong, Jenkins. Flushdyke residence. Jenkins, I've arrived. Then I'll pick you up from the station. What for? I don't get in for another two hours. Really? Oh, God. How lovely. We'll see you later. Was that Uncle Bruno, Jenkins? It was, sir. And he's on his way. He seems to have it well in hand, sir. How marvellous. And so it was that Bruno Le Creme Flashdyke came to visit his nephew in September of 1922. But no sooner had Uncle Bruno set foot in Flashdyke Manor than the reason for his visit became abundantly clear. Was it? There's a treasure map and a fortune waiting for us in Egypt. Will you come with me? Jenkins. I'll pack a bag, sir. Jolly well done, Othit. Osset Flashdyke starred Simon Carter as Osset, Gideon Clear as Jenkins and Pancho, Bob Sinfield as Uncle Bruno, and Andrew Jordan as Ralph Werfenhofer. Cronar Industrial Smoothing, written by David Lucas, featured the voice of Tony Brandon. Osset, written by Simon Carter and produced by David Lucas, featured the music of Rob Vandenberg, Julia Eklar, Bo Hall, David Kempers, Paul and Jeff Vidov, care of musicalley.com. For all the latest news and information, check out www.ossetflushdyke.co.uk or follow me on Twitter at Osset Flushdyke. That's Osset, O-S-S-E-T-T, flush as in lavatory, dyke as in woman with comfortable shoes. And now... Playing us out, Mr. Pete Gold, care of petegold.co.uk. Total Pip Midiarios. There are many things in life that I have learned. Like respect cannot be bought, it must be earned. I have learned that talk is cheap. I look before I leap, and I sniff the milk to see if it has turned. But there's one thing that remains a mystery And it seems that I am just too blind to see You know, they say one guy in ten Prefers the company of men But why do people think that one is me? Why do people think I'm gay? 
Is it something that I say? Am I campus like a fay? Is it my love of Doris Day? Why do people think I'm gay? Not that that isn't okay. But let me ask you if I may. Why do people think I'm gay? Don't get me wrong, it's cool. This world takes different strokes. Different strokes. But personally, I just don't fancy blokes. Fancy blokes. You know, there's no enjoyment finer than to play with a lady's special place. At least that's what I often tell my folks. That's what he's always told his folks. So why do people think I'm gay? Is it the way that I sashay each time I hear YMCA? With my nipples on display. Okay, I'm sensitive, polite, and neatly dressed. Neatly dressed. And yes, I own a fitted lycra vest. It's just for jogging. So I moisturize my face, and I'm a fan of Will and Grace. And I wish my girlfriend had a hairy chest. Just hairy chest. But why do people think I'm gay? Has my libido gone astray? I blame it on my Uncle Ray And that thing with the bidet How do people know I'm gay? No, I'm gay. Have they met my friend Jose? Jose? And now I have to find a way To tell my fiancée 